Thank you, Gerard. Thank you, Joe. Hey, isn't it cool, you know, because um, we are essentially one family, aren't we? And it's just so good that it doesn't matter where you are. Once you've had the revelation of the grace of God as Jesus has presented it to us and made it known to us, it doesn't matter where you are, you're on the same, same vibe. Amen? Amen? That's awesome. I've just got one more question, if you don't mind. Why did Warren really leave Singapore? <laughs> No condemnation. No, 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 all good. Warren and Lena have been an absolute blessing since they uh, came and joined us, and we just so appreciate them and to have come from new creation. And like, um, it's all still very new in many ways to me and to us, what church looks like um, under the gospel of grace. Amen. Um, and so um, one thing that we're really passionate about is keeping the message on the main thing. And we know it's not a thing, it's a person, and his name is Jesus. Amen. So welcome and bless you, and thank you for joining us today. And take our love back there when you get to go back. But in the meantime, God is good? All the time. All the time. Good. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Let's get into it. It's one we're all familiar with. Um, I was unpacking this maybe about a month ago, and I just want to go, I feel led back there today, um, just to bring some things out to you. And it starts like this, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Verse 2, for we also have had the good news. Say good news. Good news. Good news. Proclaimed or preached to us just as they did, but the message they heard was not of any value to them because they did not share the faith of those who obey. Verse 3, now, we who have believed, say that's me, enter that rest, the promise of rest, just as God has said, so I declared on my oath and my anger, they shall never enter my rest. And yet his works have been finished since the creation of the world, for somewhere he has spoken about the seventh day in this way. On the seventh day, God rested from all his works. Verse 5, and again in the passage above, he says, they shall never enter my rest. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest. In other words, there is a rest still yet to be realized by those who've been promised it. I'll say that again. There is a rest still yet to be taken possession of by those who've been offered it. And how many know that we are in a, a realm of grace that involves receiving, not achieving? And the rest that's available to us is not on the basis of what we've done, but on the basis of what Jesus has done. Amen? Amen. And so his grace, which is what makes his rest available, is still there for each and every believer. And as we've already said, his grace is sufficiency for the day. What day? Today. This is the day that the Lord has made. And on the basis that he's made the day, there's a rest to be entered into. Yeah. And we'll, we'll dig a bit deeper into that. Therefore, since it still remains for some to enter that rest, and since those who formerly had the good news, there it is again, the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their disobedience, did not go into what? They did not enter into the promise. Remember, we... We, we already looked at that. The promise that came to all the people by way of Moses, given the promise to God, go in and take possession of the land that I have given you. That land is a land of promise, and in the land of promise, it's supply, flow, milk and honey, a land of supply which produces a rest and it produces a peace for the people. So what was a place in the old is a person in the new, and his name is Jesus, right? So that was always the type and picture but we live in the substance. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. That what we have, the promise we have is a greater promise than the one they have because they had a geographical place. We've got the person. His name is Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Since those who formerly had the good news proclaimed to them did not go in because of their... Guess what's happening right now this morning? Good news has been proclaimed. Mm. Verse 7. God again said a certain day, calling it, calling it, just for the one person who didn't say it, calling it, thank you, 
This he did when a long time later he spoke through David, as in the passage already quoted today. If you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken later about another day. Verse 9, there remains therefore a Sabbath rest for who? The people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest also rests from their works, just as God did from his. Verse 11, let us therefore make every effort to enter God's rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. Genesis 2 verse 1 to 3, then we'll have a chat. Thus the heavens and the earth were completed. They were finished in all their vast array, verse 2. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. In other words, he set it apart. He blessed the day and he made it holy. Why? What was the qualification from God's perspective to put the blessing on the day? Here's the answer. Because on it he rested. From all the work of creation, that he had done. Now, we digged into this, as I say, a few weeks ago, but I feel led strongly back to here because this has everything to do with, with reigning in life and walking and enjoying an abundance of grace, that we would understand the principle of rest on a far deeper level, and there's a reason why. God blessed the seventh day for one reason and one reason only, because on it he rested. So what does that tell us? God's blessing works exclusively in the realm of rest. I'll say it again. God's, and the reason I've got to emphasize this is because it's counterintuitive to the human condition. We assume that God will bless our effort. Is that fair? I mean, that makes logical sense that God's going to meet us in our strength, not our weakness, yeah? Who's heard the fra phrase, um, you know, do your best and God will do the rest. Now that's a subtle little lie because it's, it is making you assume on your strength and that God's going to meet you in your best. That's not grace. His grace is sufficiency for weakness, meaning that there's nothing ever required on the part of the new creation who's entered into the realm of the finished work, to receive anything that God has for them. Guess what? The moment you believed into the person and the finished work of Jesus, all of God's best was provided. All of God and nothing left out. See, he can't give you his son and hold back any part of blessing because the blessing is Jesus. Amen. He can't give you his son and withhold righteousness from you because Jesus is your righteousness. He can't give you his son and hold back a portion of salvation because Jehovah is salvation and his name is Jesus. He can't give you his blessing. He can't give you his son and you be exposed to a curse because you're in Jesus. And either the curse was addressed at the cross or it wasn't. And if you've believed into the person and finished work of Jesus, you've been transferred out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And guess what? In the light, a curse cannot exist. So what does it mean to walk in the light? It means to walk with your eyes on Jesus. Arise, shine for the... In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word came into humanity, and darkness could not apprehend it. Why? Light penetrated. Light is a person and his name is Jesus. Every definition you want to understand out of the old is realized in the new and his name is? Jesus. The simplicity of our gospel is the power and the message. But such is the nature of the human condition. We like to complicate things to make ourselves feel, you know, deserving or worthy. But I think religion gets more off on complicating things because one, it doesn't understand the truth in the first place, but people are captive for lack of knowledge. So if you can fill people up with lies, 
They'll never really walk in the truth. But those who the Son sets free, but you can't, know, you, know, you can't walk in the truth until you know it. And the truth cannot make you free until you know it. So we re-emphasize the truth every Sunday so that we walk in another level of freedom. So God's blessing works in the realm of rest. And, and I cannot overstate how important it is to know that. God's blessing is most operative in the realm of rest. That's the way he's designed it. The principle is complete. The work is finished. It is established that the blessing works in rest. Because that puts us in a position of taking a certain response when in other times we may have tried to meet the demand. Yeah? We've now got another attitude or another way of thinking. And so since Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever, when he said, come to me and I will give you He's giving you rest and he's inviting us into rest because his blessing is operative in that space, in the realm of rest. So what he is saying is, when he says, come to me and I will give you rest, those who learn to rest in me will be blessed in me. That's what he's saying. Those who learn to rest in me will be blessed in me because the blessing is designed to be operative in rest. And I think some, and I'm the first to put my hand up, that, that um, inclination to rest when I feel sort of the proclivity is to work is something I have to constantly work at, which is a bit of a contradiction in terms because as we've already read, if there's anything you're going to make an effort at, if there's anything you're going to work at, it's working at resting. A hundred percent. That is the realm of the blessing. Now I want to quickly revisit the definition of rest here, just to lay a bit of a foundation, so we understand what rest looks like and what rest doesn't look like. So we can put a finger on it, or we can put a finger on ourselves in those moments. Rest by definition here comes out of this Hebrew word sabbat, which, as you can probably recognize, um, is establishes the principle of the Sabbath, the Sabbath rest. So when he talks about the seventh day, when we talk about a Sunday, um, it is the principle of rest, right? Which means to cease and to desist, to rest, to refrain from labor and exertion. Rest, interestingly, is a doing word. It's a verb, meaning... It's something we have to make an effort to do. We have to make an effort to rest. Who can relate to this? I can, man. I can be the so I can be so unrested and at, at times and, and need to be hearing, hearing this kind of message. So rest uh, on the part of a new creation is something of a discipline or habit we need to build into our lives. And now we have the wisdom of God and the spirit of God to be able to help us put a finger on those moments when we're starting to be, to be lured out of rest. The same way, you know, fallen man Adam and Eve were lured out of rest. And the outcome was what? They entered into the realm of works and fear became a reality in their domain. Now, something I just want to, there's a powerful uh, relationship between the rest of the Lord and the peace of the Lord. Where the rest of the Lord is, the peace of the Lord is. Where there's a rested mind, there's the peace of mind. Where there's a rested heart, there's peace in the heart, yeah? So they're interchangeable. Where you see rest, you can interchange that for peace. The rest of the Lord is the peace of the Lord. Remember, Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. He also said, "Um, "Rest, I leave. uh, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace do I give peace. So that's interesting. There's a different kind of peace and there's a different kind of rest available to the new creation. It's not the same as what the world does. In fact, the world cannot give us the rest that Jesus gives us, nor can it give us the peace that Jesus gives us. And on that basis, it cannot give us the blessing that Jesus gives us because our blessing is predicated on his rest. Okay? Important. So that's now, okay, so that's rest. 
And so when we're talking about the rested posture for the new creation, it's an inward posture. It's an inside world that, that looks like the peace of the Lord. And we know it modeled in Jesus' life, no matter what was going on around him circumstantially, he had another world going on inside him based from another perspective, remember? God's perspective. So while many could have a meltdown in the face of a storm, he had a posture of peace in it and he, let, and he was led from the inside, not the externals. Yeah, remember that? And so that's what peace is. Well, or that's what rest looks like. What does rest, what is rest not? And it took me about 25 seconds to compile a list of what rest doesn't look like. Here's the, the unrested condition and its proclivities. Stress, anxiety, anger, worry, concern, guilt, shame, blame, condemnation, and condemning, bitterness, suspicion, doubting, agitation, uncertainty, insecurity, unrest. And I would suggest that all of those words I just read out are ultimately a symptom of fear. And uh, they are, fear is what's underneath all that stuff. Fear. And we know that because what was Adam's manifestation at the point he reached into himself and departed from the grace that was in the garden, fear entered his condition. And as a result, stress, anxiety, anger, worry, concern, guilt, shame, blame, condemnation and condemning. He even condemned God, the woman you gave me. The audacity of the human condition when he himself is the source. Hey, it's foul. Horrible thing. Bitterness, suspicion, doubt, agitation, uncertainty, insecurity, unrest. They are all symptoms of, and I would say those things I just read and fear is the factory setting of fallen man Adam and the human condition. That's his factory setting, yeah? That's, that's him at his core, the default position of the old creation, fallen creation, old man, you know, fallen man Adam and all those in and of him fears the default setting. We know this because every time, you know, God comes into the equation in the, in the Old Testament, he's got to start by saying, do not fear. Yeah. So he's addressing the condition and its full manifestation. And the irony is of all the people you need not fear, it's God. And so here we see here, that's, so these are all the manifestations of the fallen man, Adam, and that's his factory setting, but something changed. What casts out all fear? What drives out fear? What kind of love? Perfect love. Who is perfect love? Yeah. Jesus. So there is a new factory setting for the new creation. And his name is? Yeah. And he drives out all what? Yeah. And that's our default position as a new creation, it's an, and it's on the basis of your consciousness of the love of God as Jesus reveals it, that you can enter into rest. And on that basis, you know, all those things that I read out, that I'm, I admit, I deal with some of that stuff. Anxiety, worry, stress. I won't list too much more because <laughs> there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But I, 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 can, can we get honest? Can we get real? And we can get real because there's no condemnation in Jesus. If we can't be, you know, if you can't disclose the condition to the physician, how can he meet you at that point of need? His grace is sufficiency for weakness, not strength. I'm like, Lord, I'm, I feel stressed. And right there in that moment, it's like, okay, what is, the, what is the, the root of this? Where's this coming from? And it can be a circumstance, but there's also something more. Because rest, in my view, is, is one of the greatest ways we can honor the Lord, is by resting in Him. I would say it's an act of worship, that I would rest in the Lord when the, there's an opportunity to be stressed in myself. Because what it says, the statement it's making and the signal it's sending to God is, I trust you. I can't understand what's going on. It's freaking me out. It's freaking out others. I don't know what the future holds. I don't know what's behind what's going on. But in any case, nevertheless, all is well 
with my soul. Why? Because I've got a confidence that comes from another place. Because I've got a promise who comes from a certain kind of person. And, be, and, and, and it's not just about the promise, but it's the nature of the promise giver. And if our promise giver is love, and he is, and he's perfect love, and he is, and if he'll never leave me or forsake me, if there's nowhere I can do that would take me outside out of, of his love, then I have full confidence in the promise. And to the extent I'm oriented towards Jesus, I have confidence in the promise, and I have the, the potential to enter into the rest of the promise giver. But it's understanding the nature of the promise giver that gives us that confidence and that enables us to enter into that rest. Let me give you an example. It's, it's that love that you know, right? So, and, and this picture is sort of burnt into my mind because it was a great example to me when, when my daughter was very young and I'd be in my study. I'd be in, uh, in the Holy of Holies. <laughs> Preparing my message and then, then the door would come open and then she'd walk and she'd go... You know, dad, 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 straight in there. Um, you could say it's, it's um, um, approaching the throne of grace with boldness. <laughs> dad, 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 um, with, 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 with prayer and supplication. Dad, 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 dad. I'm contemporizing the verses, right? Dad, 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 dad. Can I some love? Of course she can, little girl. Oh, thank you, Dad. Thank you. And off she goes. What's just happened there? That's a great state. To me, that's a beautiful thing, that she has that confidence. Where does that come? That doesn't just happen. She doesn't have that confidence because she read, confidently approach. I'm being serious. Confidently approach Daddy. There's a confidence in there. Where did that confidence come from? It wasn't a verse read. It was something she knew about the promise giver, right? And the amazing thing is, thank you, thank you, gratitude, thank you, Dad, and off she goes. She's responded in such a way that she already has possession of the promise before it's in her hand. I'll say that again. There's a thankfulness and there's just a, an assumption that the promise that's been given is my possession before I've got it, and on that basis, it's a thank you, and off we go. And as simple as that analogy sounds, it very much should define the posture of a new creation towards Daddy God. Dad, 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 Dad. Cast your cares upon him. And it's on the basis of knowing certain things. There's a love. Now, my love is nowhere near as perfect as God's, but there's a baseline relationship there that's been established on the basis of love, not works. See, there's no deservedness in the system. It's not an asking on the basis of what I've done. There's not even this idea that I should approach to ask on the basis of merit. It's a foreign idea in this relationship till we educate our kids out of it into human ways of doing things. But are you with me? But how, do, do we have the same sort of simplicity of relationship with Daddy, God? And we can have it and it's available to us to the extent we have a revelation of his kind of love for us. Amen? And that's the way it should be. There should be nothing religious about the way we approach him. Actually, the more religious you are, the less you know him. I know in former times, in previous, less knowledge-based um, approaches towards God, in my old days of mixing, actually hardly knew grace. It was more to do with law. I mean, the approach to God was just, right now, it's sort of like, dear God, Father, Lord, God, Father, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit, Trinity, God, Father. Um, uh, your word says in John chapter 2, verse 5, and it's just like, that's not a relational conversation at all. Let me tell you what's far more spiritual than that. Dad, dad, dad. Why? One's based on relationship, one's based on distance and religion. Am I fair? Hey, but feel me now. If you like the daddy, father, God, Jesus, Holy Spirit thing and it works for you and based on relationship, sweet. 
go for it. But I'm just asking. You know, I'm just posing the idea that if that's our approach to God, it sounds like it's more like we're trying to convince God or we're trying to convince ourselves as well as God. Yeah? Yeah. I think so. Anyway, so what it means is we've got this new setting. Well, we should have. Set your minds on things, not on. In other words, set it on our new settings. You're a new creation. The old is past. Behold, all things have become new. It's so good. So when we're faced with a challenge or a crisis or a concern, anyone relate to that? There's a new and living way to respond to these sort of issues that predicates a peace that can be taken possession of within and it's in the realm of peace that the blessing starts to flow. 100%. What does it look like? What does a real rest response look like? Well, I mean, here's my go-to. You should know it, you will know it, and you won't at all be surprised when I say it. The Lord is my I shall not lack want. Now watch this. He maketh me to stand up and get busy. <laughs> no, that's what religion would do. Hey, 100%. It'll, religion will remove into the realm of the flesh. So do the flesh reap corruption. But here's the, here's the instinct of this individual based on who he knows. He maketh me to lie down in green pasture, a place of supply, a place of comfort, a place of rest. He leads me beside still waters, and that literally means waters of rest. Versus the individual who's tossed to and fro. Yeah? Who can relate to that idea? Tossed to and fro, waters of rest. Now here's it. He rests my, he rests my soul. It's crazy. But I remember a time when I, as a Christian, I was a bit afraid of what Jesus would be like if I actually met him. Condemnation. I was feeling the hammer was going to come down. Never knew him in the light of the cross and in the light of God's love. It was always just this, you know, there was always this doubt and insecurity that if God is happy with me or is he not, not realizing that he was not approaching me on the basis of my goodness. He was not approaching me on the basis of my qualification. His approach to me was on the basis of his son and what he has done. And like I said last year, I just think the finished work is a genius idea, man. That right now in our humanity, we can say with all confidence, we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus and still be aware of our fallibilities and insecurities and our imperfections. But in light of that, we can say it with full confidence because of who Jesus is and what he's done. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's awesome. And the greatest example to me is like the old prayers in the old days that, you know, the prayers of a righteous man availeth much and never felt righteous. So I never bothered praying or whatever prayers there were, they were weak. Why? because I never understood my righteousness in Jesus. And so the, those prayers lack confidence. Who can relate to that? I mean, it's like, why bother? I blew it last night. Had a massive fight with the wife. Why on earth would God want to do anything for me? But what's the orientation in that moment? Me. Or, you know, did something stupid or, or had a drama with someone or whatever your thing might be. I don't know. 
but it's in those very moments that he's given us the helper to orient us back to, to Jesus who continually reveals to us and exposes us to God's love. And it passes human understanding, and it does, because it makes no sense that he'd bless a mess. But it's exactly the mess that he can bless. Amazing, eh? I know the old saying, God can't bless a mess. So you're like, no, well, better get my act together again. Make a whole lot of promises to God, get busy, get working, get striving, and it's just like, that's a recipe for burnout, man. That's why stress levels, interestingly, based on research out of the States, is most prominent, believe it or not, in the Christian community. There's another layer of stress, not only the stresses of the world, but the stress of their standing with God because they don't know what he has done. And actually, the apostles very clear that the first peace we possess is peace with God. If you don't have that, mate, you've got no peace. We have peace with God through what the cross has accomplished. And that's the rest we possess. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack. He makes me lie down. We get the picture. He leads me beside waters of rest. He rests my soul. So, Whereas religion would measure spiritual maturity on the basis of our performance, true spiritual maturity is understood on the basis of our rest. That in the midst of a storm, we have a posture of peace. And it's in the rest that the blessing is bestowed. The rest of God. Isn't that amazing? So what it means in the face of adversity, crisis, whatever the issue may be, we have another response available to us as a new creation. And you would have seen there that it was the good report that predicated the entering the rest several times, yeah? Versus what a bad report. We unpacked the bad report with the spies and all that drama out of Numbers 13 the other week. They were given a promise by God and they returned a bad report. Only two, their confession was consistent with the promise. And on that basis, God himself singles out Caleb and says, this guy here, he has a different spirit. And on the basis of his spirit, he will possess. So then, faced with adversity, whatever your thing may be, look how the psalmist attacks this in verse 4. Yea, though I walk through the valley of a problem. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of. I will fear no evil. Which is not to say there's no valleys ahead, people. You might be in one right now. Yeah. Um, Christianity is not a valleyless existence. Actually, it's the awareness of who we are in in the midst of the valleys that sets apart the new creation from the human condition. I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. What does he do? He makes me lie down. He rests my soul. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my problems. Enemies, you anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. And the one that buzzes me out every time I think about it. Surely, surely, like for sure, goodness. Whose kind of goodness? God's kind of goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And I've already said what was the house in the old is a person in the new. His name is Jesus. Now, do you know what dwell means by definition in the Hebrew? It means to sit down and stay down. To sit and remain. Stay down with me. So what happens when you sit? I've used this analogy before, but I think it's very powerful. What does it mean to sit? This is what it means. At the moment, I'm fully engaged in my own strength, in my own ability. Yeah? 
The moment I sit, I have to disengage of all effort and entrust myself into the ability of another for the sake of this. Who are we rested in? Our posture is seated. And on the basis that I'm seated, I'm fully disengaged from my own ability and I'm completely entrusted and rested in the ability of another. Now, you know what looks really silly? Is when I start to try and hold my weight in this position. Oh, Lord Jesus, Father, Lord God, Lord Jesus. Sounds like I'm starting to trust my own prayer. Right? This is called mixture. It's a, it's a ridiculous spiritual posture, but it is the posture of many. Problem comes. Drama comes. Bad report. Here's a good one, criticism. <laughs> Do you get it? Accusation. <laughs> you know what happens? That's, that's the posture. So this is the human condition, always trusting in their own, own strength and ability. But here's the spiritual posture, particularly in the midst of challenge and crisis. They're trusted into the willingness and the ability of another. And there's only one other thing that happens from that position, and we'll finish with it. But are you with me? So there's a mental, there's a, a little mental picture you can just reflect on during the week is with regards to what's your posture in the moment. So sit down and stay down. <laughs> sit yourself down in Jesus. That's very scriptural. We've been raised and seated together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You know, we say it often, as he is, so are we in this world. If he's seated, we're seated. And the seated position means we're entrusted into the willingness and the ability of another, and it's in rest that the blessings flow. Surely goodness and mercy. I love that. So you may get some bad news, you may hear a bad report or be faced with a, with a negative situation. But we have a response and it's called good news. You can get bad news, but you've got good news. Good news, it's the good news that produces faith. Remember, they didn't mix the good news with faith. And as a result, because faith, it's faith that predicates rest. Because it's a posture of trust. I'm trust the moment I entrust myself into another, I rest in, into that person. Are you with me? So it's really the trust question, which is faith is trust and trust is faith. It's, it's where's our trust in that moment? That's the key question because where our trust is will, will, will determine, right, um, what our response is. And what predicates our, our trust is hearing good news. Faith comes by and hearing what? The word of Christ, the word of Jesus. Now we get a lot of words. Man, this week, crazy words. New Zealand hero, like the New Zealand meet, like shootings every day, ram raids every day, recession, economics, global warming, rah, rah, rah. COVID, like there is no lack of bad reports out there for you and I to latch on to. Am I right? But we've got another report. We've got an overriding report. We've got a superior report that we should be hearing above that stuff, and especially when that stuff's going on, that allows us to respond and to release faith towards God and his promise made ours in Jesus and in that posture we rest and it's in rest that the blessing flows. For we also have had the goodness or good news proclaimed to us just as they did, but the message they heard was of no value to them because they did not share the trust 
the faith of those who obeyed. Now we who have believed, believed what? Believe what? The good news. The good news about who? Jesus. We enter into that rest. So it's the good news that predicates the rest of God and it's in the rest of God that his blessings flow best. Religion says to Jesus, what are the works that we should work the works of God? And just saying that sentence makes me tired. What are the works that we should work the works of God? This ties in beautifully with Hebrews. These are the works of God, Jesus said. Believe into the one who he sent. In other words, our work is to rest in his finished work. No matter what it is that we face. I think that is so good. So, here's the pattern. Bad news comes, good news answers. Bad news comes, good news answers. We've got the good news. With the same spirit of faith, we believe, therefore we speak. And all of God's promises are yes, and the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. I've been saying it, there's no such thing as a silent believer. God did not think and there was, he said and there was. And we have made in his image the same, exact same opportunity to respond because interestingly he was speaking into chaos and brought order through what he spoke. The word is quick and powerful. His words and our words together. How can two walk together unless they be in agreement? Here's a great one. I forgot to, I didn't make a slide, but this is really cool. It's a little quote I found in my research to do with rest. It goes like this. Christ can make the rest of your days be the best of your days if he is the rest of your days. Did you like that? Yeah, I don't know where the slide went. Ah, I'm so annoyed with myself. I'll say it again. You got half of it, eh? Christ can be the rest of your days, be the best of your days, if he is the rest of your days. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. I like that. So we'll finish where we started. We were talking about this last week and it comes back to what I was just talking about is how you operated from the, how you operate, how we live from the, the posture of peace and rest in the seated position. For if by, Romans 5, 17, if by the trespass of the one man, death reigned through that one man, we're not in that one man, we're in the new man, right? How much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man Jesus Christ word definition reign to be king to exercise kingly power to reign a metaphor to exercise the highest level of authority brother Warren pops up to me last week and says hey here's a bit more definition of reign and it's a blinking good one What's the posture of a king when he reigns? And how does he rule or reign his realm from the seated position? He speaks. She speaks to the situation and the word does the work. Who said that no word sent out from his mouth shall come back void? God. That's the posture of the seated position. Isn't that beautiful? I think that's awesome. Now, can we distribute the emblems, please, guys? That would be awesome. You would have noticed packed in the middle of the psalm is this beautiful moment that we're going to celebrate together called Holy Communion. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my problems 
my enemies. This is a beautiful thing. And you know, it's one of the very few things Jesus had Paul institute into the, the community of believers that as often as they gather, that they would do this to orient the people back in his direction. Amen? Why? Because to the extent we are entrusted to Jesus, we rested in him. Amen? And I think this is a beautiful thing. But I love that. You know, that, that whole being seated is a very powerful statement. And I'm talking about an in, inward seating. You know what I'm talking about, right? You know what I'm talking about. It's an inward seating, an inward posture of trust and reliance on Jesus that produces a rest. Very powerful, but it really comes into its own in those moments when our inclination is to engage our own ability. Righteousness is a fantastic example on the principle of righteousness. So many of us, and we've all been there, I've been there, we've tried to take righteousness from this position really working at it, yeah? Relying on our own strength, our own ability, our own knowledge, our own goodness, our own prayers, our own fasting, our own works, our own sacrifices, that's so tiring. Instead of just resting into his righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Doesn't that just make you so thankful? Father, we're just so thankful as we gather this morning and we just center ourselves again on your goodness. We thank you for your son. Lord Jesus, you're amazing. You just continue to blow our minds as we discover more of your love and your goodness and what you've provided for us through the cross, the marvel of the cross. Right there, you were broken. You met us in our and our exact worst, and you gave us our best, your best. Your body was broken for us, so we could be rested and whole and complete. Body, soul, and spirit, we receive right now of all its fullness. In Jesus' name, amen. And for your blood that speaks better things, based on better promises because of the blood, forgiveness of all sin, past, present, and future, all because of the blood. We just are so thankful again, Lord, and we receive of your fullness in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and lift up his countenance upon you. Go into this awesome week with the wonderful gift of his shalom peace. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Have an awesome day.